I'm going to go back to my experience learning GDNT. So I'm going to first start talking about my journey. Why did I focus on GDNT? And this is a nice little motivational poster. It says, cluelessness, there are no stupid questions, but there are a lot of inquisitive idiots. And uh, you can find these posters. They're, they're very tongue-in-cheek at despair.com. They're kind of too true in some ways. But when I first started out, I was a bit of an inquisitive idiot. I graduated with a bachelor's of mechanical engineering from a very good school. And they did teach me a lot. I'm not trying to knock them at all. I really learned a lot to prepare myself for this. Here's what I learned in college. I learned probably like the most of you. I learned CAD. I learned statics, dynamics, mechanics, all that. And FEA analysis, something you know, fairly advanced. But while I learned this, there were a few things that I was missing as a professional design engineer. I didn't have any proper blueprint training. I've never worked with 2D drawings when I graduated. I also didn't have any really good tolerance analysis experience when I started out. I didn't even really know how parts were made, how things were machined, how everything actually worked. And GD&T, of course, I was missing. I, I didn't have any GD&T experience because I didn't have any blueprint reading. It was kind of odd that I didn't have this because as soon as I got thrown into the design engineering role, I realized really quickly that without some of the stuff over here, you really can't do much with this over here. You can do a lot. There's, there's good skills that you can still have. But a lot of this very basic stuff is very much needed, especially when you're working for a lower supplier, like a tier two, tier three supplier. It was almost like I was, I was training to be an author, and I learned story structure and character development, but I didn't really learn how to read or even learn what a book was. So what I want to go over is how we need to be rethinking how we're teaching design kind of from the bottom up. I mean, we do a lot of CAD modeling, but we should be at least instilling a few fundamental concepts that come from gd and into our world. The one everyone understands is size. Everyone puts sizes on their drawing. They usually don't miss a size dimension. It's tough to do. Then we have form. Form is the shape or how the part actually looks in, in free space. And form is controlled by your size due to rule number one, as we learned earlier. Then we have our relatable dimensions, our, our relatable types of features, which is location and orientation. These are big ones that I was completely missing. I would put an angular dimension on something, you know, plus or minus so and so degrees to give it an angle. But I was never quite trained that these four fundamentals are what truly make up a part design. And this is how we should be teaching this, and this is what we should be teaching, because this is the four fundamental elements of gd &T. You can't have any of the 14 main symbols without these four core elements. Every symbol is either a combination or a specific form of them. So this gave me a different way of thinking and really helped me accelerate my career as I went through. My original thinking about gd and is it's just a whole hodgepodge of symbols. They're just out there. There's no consistency. They're little tweaks that you add to a part. But it wasn't until I, I looked at it as a whole powerful set of tools that we can use. Little by little, I realized that you're now able to give a specification of what is functionally important without tightening size dimensions necessarily. You can have a larger circular tolerance zone versus square ones. And I'm sure the, the 57% numbers come up earlier today at some point with the circular dimension. Uh, you can also have variable geometric tolerances based on the functional envelope of the features. Improving the manufacturability and your ability to both specify a functional requirement and design and then carry it out in manufacturing, but then also, as Jim was pointing out, add functional gauging to your part when you're using the MMC. And finally, it gave me a core reference system that is unambiguous for design, production, and quality. It carries along. Everyone can understand the core datum reference frame as it moves along if they understand GD&T, and especially when you're giving it to a supplier. 
you have the same datum reference frame if you use the same datum set. This organized everything in my head, and finally, instead of looking at GD&T as these little subtle tweaks, it was actually what should be the core of thinking in design engineering. You really should be focusing on this as a whole. Instead of just worrying about CAD, worry about how your parts fit. Worry about all of this stuff that links together. It's a way to learn engineering as you're going through design. Now, how to ensure our workforce is more knowledgeable? And this is one of my favorite ones. Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, which is why engineers sometimes smell really bad. <laughs> As I said, when I started out, I was overwhelmed, and mainly it's a lack of confidence. I could do a bunch of great things. I really could. I could design a nominal 3D design and analyze the stress strain of that design using FEA or other methods. But the problem is, is that we're missing in some, in some areas. I'm not saying every, every school doesn't teach the right stuff. They are teaching the right stuff. It's just we're missing just a few small things that would greatly increase the confidence and the ability of our new engineers. I didn't know what I didn't know. No one told me I had to know this stuff. Reading a standard drawing, geometric tolerance ramifications, cost impacts of design choices, making drawings unambiguous, just like my other one before, that was completely ambiguous. Understanding capabilities or processes, and finally, how to talk the talk. And this is the one I, I again, I'll, I'll make a fool of myself, but I learned this the hard way. If you ask someone, if you called up a machinist, and now this is for the inch crowd. I know a lot of you guys are in metric. I'm in metric too, but this is why. I'll just claim that's why I didn't know. But, and you say, I need a tolerance of 3 tenths on that, on that print right there. I need a 3, three tenths on that diameter. Are they going to come back with this, 0.3? This is tenths, right? This is in math. You have the, the tenths, the hundredths, and thousandths. You've learned that, right? Well, this would be 300 thousandths. And three-tenths to a machinist is actually this. It's a thousand times different. It's just a terminology difference. But we never talk about it. We never talk about these differences in the way that we teach things and the way that it actually goes on on the shop floor. We've done some analysis on blueprint reading at technical schools that offer associate's degrees versus ABET accredited engineering schools. Now, this is a con this is a study on about 100 schools, about 50 technical schools, and about 50 engineering schools that we did. But we looked and saw which ones offer blueprint reading. And if there was a class that probably had it, we gave the schools the benefit of the doubt, or if they offered it in some way. And I'm just saying basic blueprint reading. Usually, if they don't offer blueprint reading, there's no gd &T behind it. For the machinist degree, CAD, CAM, and CNC, associate's degrees, 92% of the 50 schools that we looked at had blueprint reading as a part of their curriculum. Now, we looked at mechanical engineering schools, and it was only 17% part of the core curriculum. So why are machinists asked to learn, GD and or learn blueprint reading, just the basics of blueprint reading, but our design engineers, our manufacturing engineers, our quality engineers, the mechanical engineers that come are not offered this. I mean, I, I think there's electives, there's manufacturing directions that you can go into, and I think that's great. But drawings are still the primary form of communication in engineering. And I know that the, the 3D uh, modeling is, is the new future. Everything's going to be just on a, on a screen. You know that you look and you have the 3D model. But you still are going to need fundamental concepts that come from blueprint reading on that. You still need a way to, to view everything in a nice, consolidated view. So we tend to focus on the key entry-level concepts. And this is what we believe in our company. Blueprint reading, drawing interpretation, uh, engineering process, the basics of how a part is made, and gd &T, just basics of gd &T. These three concepts would give you the greatest impact in mechanical engineering. It's the missing link. Whether you go into design, manufacturing, quality, whatever. If it involves a part in some way that you are making, you're physically doing it. Unless you go into HVAC and thermo and that side, then maybe this isn't as impactful. But none of us in this room are in that category, I'm assuming. 
What we've done is we're creating an academic partnerships to build customized curriculum lessons around the most important concepts that we feel that students should learn when they graduate in a mechanical engineering program. We've created a student version of our gd and Basics Fundamentals course and also are working on our Mechanical Drawing Basics for students. These give all the students an entry-level view into the world of engineering and these key concepts that are oftentimes missing from engineering curriculums. We have a few current partners. San Diego State, we have roughly 500 students now who have gone through our GD&T Fundamentals course, an online course, through San Diego State University that are now able to add GD&T to their resume. They know the basics of gd &T. It's tough to teach every single thing about gd &T in a college curriculum, but we do the best we can to focus on the 20% the that will make the 80% the of the difference in their life. And also we're working with First Makerspace, which is a new innovative learning platform for 3D printing. Again, if anyone's interested in hearing more about academic partnerships, you can email me directly at We've got some great information for you. We're constantly trying to tweak college level curriculums to work these into that. All right, thank you guys, appreciate it.